Good morning. It's good to unite on this Labor Day weekend, isn't it? Have uh, Monroe Campus, many of you with us today, and La Iglesia, and uh, continue to partner with Blue Bridge in the Tri-Cities, the prison. We have a, do you know that we have a congregation in the prison in Monroe? Yeah. And God is just doing incredible things amongst them. On all of our campuses, really, exciting stuff happening down at the Monroe campus. If you've never visited there, I would encourage you to do that. Take a Sunday and do that. We'll miss you here, but you'll be blessed there, okay? So just kind of get to know what God's doing throughout the church. Well, it is Labor Day weekend, and though we like the word weekend... <laughs> We don't always so much like the word labor, <laughs> right? I mean, it has some negative connotations, at least for some of us in, in, our, in our lives. Uh, in fact, um, I, I, not necessarily my band that I listen to, but uh, there was a song written uh, called Everybody Working for the Weekend. And there's... A, there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of truth uh, to those lyrics. Labor, uh, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is not a, a super encouraging word necessarily, at least the way we think about it oftentimes. We think about chores. We think about effort. We think about, you know, uh, energy and exertion. Some would think of it maybe as drudgery or struggle, sweat and toil and those sorts of things. You guys getting the idea? I think you probably are. Labor doesn't oftentimes sound that appealing to us, and yet we celebrate Labor Day, right? We celebrate that. And, and I get it. Originally, they wanted to honor laborers, acknowledge the American worker, the job force, and all of that. But really, it seems that now it's just kind of the last weekend that you have a chance to go camping, right? That last moment, you know, before the summer winds down and, and all of those sorts of schools getting started, you know. Um, the evenings start to cool down and the summer starts to exit. Can you believe summer's almost over? No, right? And we return to probably more, you know, you know, schedules that are kind of ordered. And, and uh, we, we basically now, just think about it, we basically now labor from this weekend on to pay for the holidays. That's basically what we do. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, so this morning, I want to talk about, um, take a look at what the Bible teaches about labor. That'd be interesting, won't it? Just like, like nod your head, come along with me, all right? I think it'll be thought-provoking, because I don't think we often think about that. The origin, the, the, the origin of work is depicted, actually, in the book of Genesis, okay? The very first book of the Bible tells the account of our world and humanity's very beginning. In fact, the word Genesis means beginning, beginning. In the opening passage, God is primarily viewed as or seen as a laborer, a laborer, a worker, busy with the creation of the world. In fact, if you have a chance this week, read Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 15, and the whole creation account. And if you read through the creation account, you'll find that God works for six days and he rests, doesn't he, on the seventh day. So God was the first to do work on the earth, literally creating it. And from this, we learn that legitimate work... Legitimate work reflects the activity and character of who God is, okay? Be, uh, because God is inherently good, work is also good, right? In fact, Psalm 25, 8 and Ephesians 4, 28 speak to that. In fact, Ephesians 4, 28 says, use your hands for good, hard work, 
Use your hands for good, hard work. And then it goes on to say, and give generously to others in need. That's a great reminder with what's going on in Texas, right? And, and we have an opportunity today, you have an opportunity today and all week long to give to Convoy of Hope. And our, our host pastor today will talk a little bit more about that. But further on in Genesis, Genesis 131, we read that God viewed the results of his labor and he called it good. In fact, very good is the idea there. Very good. Basically, he assesses the quality of his work efforts and determines he's done a very good job. He was pleased, in other words, with the outcome. I think most of us can relate to that, right? I mean, after a big project, you guys with me? You know, you're like involved in a big, huge project and, and you stand back afterwards and you assess your efforts and hopefully we can declare it's good, <laughs> right? It's, it's very good, not just good enough. I mean, come on, wouldn't you want your surgeon you, you, uh, to say very good? I mean, can you, can you imagine afterwards, you say, well, doc, you know, how did it go? And he says, ah, good enough. Can, I mean, wouldn't that run? A little bit. You don't want your contractor, you know, saying, well, you know, it'll do. You know, he just put on a roof for you. And you say, well, how's the roof look? Well, it'll do. No, you don't want just to do, right? You want to be excellent. You don't want your hairstylist afterwards. You know, I haven't seen it yet. What does it look good? And they say, ah, it's okay. (laughs) God evaluated his efforts and declared that the work was very good. So in Scripture, we learned that work should be productive, meaning it should produce high-quality outcomes. And we learned that there is a sense of satisfaction that comes from a job well done. Now, in Psalm 19, we read the beautiful passage that describes how God's work reveals him. To the world. Check it out with me. Psalm 19, starting with verse 1, says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the awesomeness, the majesty of God, the heavens. I was in uh, 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 over in Chelan this year camping, and I went out a number of nights and just laid in a chair and looked up at the sky. Just skies just covered these beautiful stars. It declares the glory of God. Verse 2, day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge, they have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Through his work, right? God's work. Through his work, through his creation, God's existence is made known to every single person on earth. So let's think on this. Not only is the earth God's creation, we are his creation. You are. I am. Consider the words of Paul to the believers in Ephesus, chapter 2, verse 10, where he says, for we are God's handiwork. You and I. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't that awesome? Think about that. You are God's workmanship. You, who you are, you are created by God and for his good purposes you were created you were planned there are no accidents here okay you're not here by chance he's this amazing loving creator and he has designed you and prepared you for his purposes he has given you talents abilities Gifts that are unique to you and only you. Skills. And he calls you. He invites you to use those for his work here on earth. 
Let's understand that as his creation, our existence, our very existence, our work is to make God known to every person on earth. That's why we're here. In fact, my personal mission statement that I think about frequently is to know God and make him known to my family, friends, and neighbor. We do that by doing the work he has prepared for us. Okay, and we learn about that work, of course, in Scripture. In the Genesis account of creation, we learn that God designed a garden, and he called it Eden, Eden. And Adam was given the job of cultivating and maintaining it. Genesis 2, you can read about in verse 8 and verse 15 and, of course, other places. And then God instructed Adam and Eve to subdue it and rule over the earth. Here we learn the job. We learn the job that God has prepared them for. You ever thought about it that way? Cultivate means to foster growth and improve, okay? Maintain means to preserve from failure or decline. We have a responsibility for this earth. Subdue means to exercise control and discipline. Rule over means to administer, take responsibility by making proper decisions. Their role... Their job, if you will, their labor was to share in God's creative purposes. You see it? And when God created us, his intention was that we would work. But the word had a different meaning in the beginning. (laughs) Some of you are like tired. Okay, work, work, okay. But it had a different meaning. It meant to serve. It meant to minister. It meant to worship. Right? It didn't carry the idea of drudgery or toil, but rather blessing. It was a blessing. The problem was Adam and Eve chose to reject God's plan. They gave in to the temptation of the enemy, and they forsook their assignment. And that rejection of God is sometimes called the fall of mankind, meaning that humanity fell away from God and his perfect ways and went their own way. And that's called sin, missing God's mark. That falling away from God created a change, understand, a change in the nature of work. Bear with me. Labor took on a whole new meaning after the fall. The ground was now cursed. Work became difficult. The word toil is used to imply exhaustion, struggle, challenge, difficulty. Work itself was still good at its core, but now humanity was working for survival. And the work was so much harder. Originally, Adam and Eve could eat of the fruit in the garden, and everything was perfect, right? It was safe. It it was symbolic of an earthly paradise. In fact, that's what we call it, paradise. Now they have, have to eat from the produce of the field. It's changed, isn't it? They had to go to work for their very survival after that fall. Their field represented unprotected space, and so the work environment could now be hostile or unsafe. When humanity chose to reject God's plan and went their own way, it drastically changed the nature of labor. Because it brought about a separation between God's people and himself. That sin entered our world and changed everything. Literally anything and everything that is painful, unjust, destructive, 
selfish, sad, frustra- frustrating, hurtful, hateful, harmful, including the disasters that we see. Even the world is under the weight of that sin, is a result of sin. And it makes our day-to-day work so much harder And realize it's not a punishment from God. It's simply the result of humanity choosing to listen to the evil one rather than our perfect, loving God. But God loved us so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but shall experience eternal life. In other words, he provided the solution to the whole sin problem. God came to earth in human form, didn't he? In the person of Jesus Christ, he lived the perfect sinless life that you and I could not live. He took the sin and shame of the world, your sin, my sin, and and the consequences of that sin. He brought it all upon himself, and he went to that cross. He died, but then he arose. He came out of that grave, Right? Conquering sin and death for you and me. He was the ultimate sacrifice, paying the price that you owed, I owed, humanity owed, all of humanity. He did that for you. He did that for me. Why? Because he loves us. And he wants uh, the very best for us now and for all eternity. He wants us to experience Spiritual life, not spiritual death. Let's understand, he did all the work so that we could once again be in a loving relationship with him. Remember, working under the curse of sin is difficult, even for the Son of God, even for the Son of Man, for Jesus For he endured the cross for the hope that was set before him, which was your salvation and mine. It wasn't easy. But he did all all the work so that we could experience hope, new life, a fresh spiritual start. And when Jesus did all of that for us, stay tracking. God created It fell, God is restoring and will restore even a new heavens and a new earth. And when Jesus did all that for us, the nature of our work changed once again. When we respond to Christ's offer of love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness, we reclaim our purpose in God. We no longer work just for survival. We no longer work just for survival. We work for his purposes. So whatever we do, we should reflect God, Imago Dei, the image of God. We're image bearers of God. So whatever we do should reflect him. Whatever we do should glorify God just like Adam and Eve were designed to. Glorify simply means to give an accurate representation. Does your life, does my life give an accurate representation of God, who Jesus is? So if we are followers of Jesus, your work, whatever you do, whatever you do should portray to the world an accurate picture of God, his love. Is that you? His faithfulness, his excellence, his mercy, his forgiveness, his righteousness, his generosity, his compassion. We find this truth expressed in the New Testament in countless places, but by Paul, he says it a number of times. One, two, in a letter to the church at Coloss, the Colossians, 
and we read these verses. Be looking for now as I read them the idea of work or labor. Here we go. Colossians 3.17 says, and whatever you do. I think there's implication there, isn't there? Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. We can't help but notice a theme there, can we? In all that we do, we do it in the name of Jesus. God provided for the Apostle Paul primarily through tent making. And yet, we know Paul as living for Jesus. The idea that everything we do is for him, to glorify him. Paul wants us to understand that our lives aren't to be divided into secular and spiritual. Well, you know, I have those secular things I do, and I have those spiritual things I do maybe on Sunday. Whether you work in the automotive industry, or finance, or retail, or medical, or construction trades, or education, or technology, or agriculture, or homemaking, or arts, or sciences, whatever, it's all for him. It's all for him. And so whatever we do, we give it our best, our very best. We are to give it our all because it's all for him. I remember when I I played football in high school, And I wasn't like the biggest guy on the field. I'm bigger today than I was then. But I, you know, I I wasn't like the biggest guy out there. I certainly wasn't the fastest guy out there. But I, I was sold out to give it my all. I knew if I was going to play, if I was going to succeed, I had to give it my all. I trained. I practiced. I, I would go out. I would hit. I would try to hit harder than any other person making a tackle. Uh, and I would give everything. I would try to leave everything on the field. So when I finished the game, I barely had anything left to give. And I was reflecting on that because the season is getting going, right? Well, God calls me to the same devotion, that same effort, that same all-in way of life in everything I do for him. Throughout Scripture, we learn we are created for his purpose, So what was Christ's good purpose? Christ came to earth to seek and save the lost, right? To restore, to repair, to bring wholeness to people's lives, to our world, to make a way for you and me to be in relationship with him. Jesus came to help the spiritually lost to be spiritually found, Jesus came to set the captives free, right? To make a way of, uh, for humanity to be freed from the terrible grip of sin that ruins our lives. Jesus came to bring healing and wholeness to a spiritually broken world. Am I describing you? We each are created to share in that work. Just as the Father sent the Son, the Son is sending us. God has this beautiful story of restoration, and He invites us to participate in the story. Yeah? It's a collective effort. All followers of Jesus everywhere are called to work together. 
for the same purpose. We can read some challenging words. Jesus' words are usually challenging, aren't they? But we can read some challenging words of Jesus in Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. Let me read it to you. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, their places of worship, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing uh, every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. You ever feel like life's harassing you? (laughs) Yeah? Like a sheep without a shepherd, it says. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful But the laborers, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Friends, we are those laborers. It's not going to be somebody else. We are those laborers. And people who don't know Jesus are the field. It's our privilege to share in the work of Jesus. We are, are we moved with compassion? Come on. Do we see the brokenness of our world? Do we work to bring God's healing and, and wholeness? Do our lives introduce people to, to Jesus, the good shepherd who will lead them and guide them and protect them and provide? I, I was listening to the radio this week, and a little blurb came on from the Union Gospel Mission in Seattle. Now, this could be anything, but it just happened to be the Union Gospel Mission and the director there, and, and they were interviewing him. And the interviewer said, well, you do understand some of these people have chosen to be here. Just through their actions, this is what they get. And he just, he didn't respond. I was really interesting to listen to him. He said, you do realize there's various reasons why people are where they are. Why do you do this? He says, you know, you're right. There's a lot of reasons people, why people are at the Union Gospel Mission. He says, you know, God hasn't called me to worry so much about the why. God has called me to minister to the fact they're here. And I am called to bring redemption to their situation regardless of how they got here. Even if they're scamming the Union Gospel Mission, they need redemption. I think it's because we've mistakenly separated our lives into secular and spiritual. We grab onto these things. We've talked about it before. We think of our lives as a pie, you know, slices of the pie. I have my family slice. I have my, my work slice. You know, I have my sports slice. I have my home slice. I have my face slice. You guys are getting the idea, right? Yet God created us holy, and completely for his purposes. So it doesn't really matter which slice of the pie you happen to be in at any given time. We do it all as unto the Lord. doesn't matter if you're an owner or a boss or an employee or a stay-at-home mom or dad. Let's use every moment for the mission and purpose of Jesus. Whatever you do, do it as if you're serving Jesus. I worked, when I first came to Maltby, for a couple years, I worked another full-time job. And it was a furniture store in Redmond. And God honored me there. I worked hard, and he just kept bumping me up until he got me into different positions that eventually I would use in the church. Interesting how God works, isn't it? But so many days, I was like, God, why am I here? Can't I get started on what I'm really supposed to be doing? And I thought that a lot. Well, eventually, the church was able to compensate me so I could go full-time. And it was a blessing, honestly. Um, But you know, twice now, years and years later, and I I don't say this to, like, brag about myself. I'm trying to illustrate something. When I was there, so often the times I just thought, well, I'm not making a difference, because I knew I was supposed to make a difference for Jesus. I was a pastor, <laughs> right? And all of us are. Priests, right? Under the Lord, if you're a believer. And I would, twice I got a call. 
I got a call from one of our designers one time. Said, David, you had to come down to see what's happening at the furniture store. I thought, oh, that's weird. Okay, I know what happens there, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I went there, and she goes, I guess I'm really exciting to tell you. I thought she was going to tell me about some, you know, job she had and X number of dollars made, you know, and all that. And she goes, I gave my life to Jesus. I thought, wow, you know. She goes, yeah, you know why? Because of people like you. I go, well, what did I do? You were smiling when everyone was frowning. When everyone jumped in and was criticizing the owner, you always remained silent. I remember that. You know what that did in my heart? It does make a difference. Be the person who does everything for the Lord. Because it's him. Remember, your life is to be an accurate reflection of Jesus Glorifying God to the people around you, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors. I could do a better job with my neighbors. I'm just standing up right here today saying, I need to do better with my neighbors. Thought provoking questions, okay, that I thought I asked myself, I'm asking you now. Do you, ref, do you reflect the love and restoration of Jesus in your workplace, in your school, in your neighborhood? How do people characterize you in your neighborhood? When they think about you, what are you known as? Do you recognize that whatever, you, you know, what, whatever, wherever you are, wherever you are is your mission field? If you don't, it's very possible you're unhappy with your life and most likely your job. I find it interesting that surveys show that 7 out of 10 North Americans are dissatisfied with their jobs and dread going to work and doing the work. Almost everyone's working for the weekend. Reality is we will spend a good portion of our lives working, commuting, and thinking about our labor. Whether we like it or not, work dominates our lives, doesn't it? Since work is such a big part of our existence, how can we learn to enjoy it? What can we do to turn work from drudgery to fulfillment? Could it be we need to change the way we understand our jobs? God can use you in the workplace. In your school, in the home, for his purposes, you can make a difference where you are and can reflect Jesus to the lives of those around you. You can be the person that speaks encouragement. You can be the person that offers to pray when somebody is hurting. You can be the person that smiles when everyone is frowning. You can be the person that offers kindness in a very unkind environment right now. Don't join in on it. Because Jesus wouldn't. You can offer kindness when there's criticism. You can offer your best because you are an image bearer God let's realize that God created us to work because it's a blessing it can provide challenge excitement fulfillment author and pastor Bill Hybels wrote about it he wrote this, human labor was designed by God, assigned to every one of us, and offers us an opportunity to build confidence, develop character, and enjoy the satisfaction of accomplishment. Does that sound like a curse? There's a special sense of satisfaction. Stay with me, we're almost done. There's a special sense of satisfaction we can only find in the completion of meaningful labor. Whether it's the salesman who closes the deal, the teacher who sees new understanding in a student, 
The janitor who who surveys the clean facility and says it's ready to go. The parent who settles their child to sleep. The athlete who plays their hardest. The student who submits to uh, submits a completed paper, hopefully with some substance in it, right? The coach who invests in kids, I can still remember my coaches and what they did for me. The accountant who balances the books, the list goes on and on. We don't have to labor just to survive. God made us to labor to thrive. Do you recognize that your workplace, your school, your neighborhood, your gym, your team is your mission field? You are there primarily to make Jesus known. You are there to do the work of Jesus. Bringing hope, healing, love, kindness. You are there to make a difference. You are there to see people with compassion and mercy and love. You're there to help those that are being harassed. You're there to show them the good shepherd. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That simply means there are a lot of people who are ready to know their Savior. They're ready. They're ready for mercy. They're ready for grace. They're ready for forgiveness. They're ready for salvation. The harvest of the earth is the salvation of lost humanity. And we are the instruments that God has chosen to use. We're the sickle that's used to bring in harvest. Today's vernacular, we're the combines, <laughs> right? The doctor, the businessman, the student, the homemaker, the driver, the teacher. We are to be diligent in whatever practical work we have been gifted to do to see people offered hope and saved through Jesus. Well, let's wrap it up. Jesus said, 10.10, John, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, have it more abundantly. There's a direct correlation between working for God's purposes and a fulfilling life. I've noticed often in the church, because I've, been observing this now for a lot of years. There's a direct correlation. You see where people are like, they're all in. And there's a joy in their life. And there's an excitement in their life as they live that all in. And then for various reasons, it could be a lot of things, people stop. And you can directly see a correlation to their discouragement in life. Their dissatisfaction with life. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Would you pray with me? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this incredible opportunity to be here today. And we thank you for your incredible Son, Jesus, who came. Jesus, we thank you for all you've done for us. You have shown yourself through creation. You have offered us hope and new life and have done all the work so that we could be saved. Lord, you know and love each one of us and invite us to share in your labor, in your work. So today we recognize that we are to be about not our purposes, but your purposes. We are to share in your mission, your work to bring wholeness to a broken, hurting world. 
And Lord, that anything and everything we do, we've learned today, is ultimately for you. Thank you for using us to bring hope to those around us. Thank you for those who will receive hope to your work in our lives. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who empowers us because, Lord, we certainly can't do this on our own. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who empowers us to help us to serve our world. We thank you for the opportunity to work, to labor for you, not just to survive, but the work to thrive. We are thankful that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.